All right. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to our final Lockheed Martin uh, Mellon Robotics Center seminar of this semester. Uh, thank you again to, for, uh, to Lockheed Martin for their continued support of this seminar series. Uh, I'm uh, especially delighted uh, to welcome our uh, seminar speaker today, uh, Professor Nikolai Matney. Uh, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Systems Engineering at Penn. Uh, he's also a member of uh, Computer Information Sciences, the GRASP Lab, the Precise Center, and the Applied Math and Computer Science, uh, uh, Computational Science uh, program there. Uh, prior to joining Penn, um, he was a postdoc at Berkeley and Caltech. Uh, Caltech is also where he did his PhD in June 2016. Uh, he did his undergrad from the University of British Columbia. Uh, his research broadly encompasses uh, the use of learning, optimization, and control in the design and analysis of safety-critical data-driven autonomous systems. Uh, he's won numerous awards, uh, including uh, most recently the NSF Career uh, this year, uh, as well as the Google Research Scholar Award. Uh, he also won the Best Student Award, Best Student Paper Award at uh, ACC in 2017 and CDC in 2013, uh, which was the first ever sole author winner. Um, so I'm especially delighted to welcome Nikolai, partly because I spent a little bit of time at Penn uh, myself. So um, it's always great to see someone affiliated with Penn come in and give a talk, even if it's virtually. Uh, so what we'll do for the talk is during the talk, if you have questions, uh, audience members, you can type that out in the Q&A box. And uh, there are some natural stopping points where I can read out these questions. And when we get to the end, uh, we, you can virtually raise your hand and I can unmute you so that you can directly ask uh, our speaker the questions. Uh, so without further ado, Nikolai, take us away. All right. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and, and for the invitation to, to speak today. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today. Um, so what I'd like to tell you about um, is, is some progress that we've been making, uh, essentially working at the intersection of learning and control. Uh, and I'm also going to try to convince you that, that some of the tools we've been developing could, could be useful in the context of safe robotics. Um, you know, so over the past four or five years, if you've seen a talk on learning and control, the, the usual story that's been used to motivate motivate this kind of work kind of goes along the following lines. And, and this is exactly how I've been using how I've been motivating my work over the past few years too. Uh, you know. The, First, you know, I, I'd start by showing a slide with videos of robots doing, doing really cool stuff and argue that, that machine learning has played a, you know, a huge role in enabling these really impressive demonstrations that you know, even just a decade ago, we probably thought were pretty much not possible. And we'd sit here and we'd admire these videos a bit, uh, you know, look at the robot doing a backflip, really impressive robotic manipulation, self-driving cars are awesome. Uh, but then we'd move on to the next slide uh, with videos of everything going wrong. Uh, you know, and I'll wait a little bit for the deep mind runner to, to face plant and, and the Boston Dynamics robot to, to just take everything down with them. Um, you know, and, and I'd argue that these failures, fa these failures are, are why we still need control because the machine learning is great for performance, but if you care about safety, then, then control is really the right tool for the job. Um, and, you know, and so the usual story would then typically end with a provo provocative question of the form, how do we go about fixing things? Um, and the usual claim is that if we integrate learning and control in the right way, then this will bring us to the promised land. We'll get high performing algorithms with strong safety guarantees. Um, and, and this is usually where, where the story ends and, and then quote unquote, the real talk that would start. Um, so, so here's where I wanna maybe add a, a new element to the story um, and, and ask uh, after about five years or so of intense research in this L4DC or, or learning for dynamics and control space, um, and I picked five years based on how long the learning and control invited sessions have been running at CDC. You know, so it's a ballpark, but I think it's kind of in the right in the right area. What do we actually have to show for our effort? Have we made it to this promised land? Do we have high performing learning enabled control algorithms that also satisfy these rigorous guarantees? So what I'm actually gonna argue here is that unfortunately not really. Um, despite there having been a huge flurry of intense research activity in this space, I'm gonna argue that most results currently still fall into one of these two buckets. Um, they either work really well in practice, but have limited guarantees, or they're gonna come with really deep theory and guarantees, but they don't actually lead to anything meaningful in terms of practical algorithms. 
And then we also have industry that's turning out, oh, there's sound here and I didn't mean there to be sound, sorry. But, okay. Um, and then we also have industry that's, that's mostly churning out what I'm gonna call parlor tricks in this space using over-instrumented and over-sensed and over-trained systems. Um, I don't even count these as being meaningful contributions. Um, I don't think they're actually advancing us towards anything important in the context of high performing algorithms with, with rigorous guarantee. Okay. So if you believe my perhaps provocative statement that, that we haven't made any meaningful progress in, in this direction, then the next important question is why, right? If we actually believe the use of machine learning and more broadly, data-driven methods in the context of designing control systems and robotic systems is not a fad. And in fact, it's here to stay. And I, and I do believe that this is the case. Then I think it's important for us to understand why we're not maybe making progress you know, the kind of progress that we'd hope to be making and to think about what we can do to address this. So now let me preface kind of the answer that I'm gonna provide on the slide uh, with a little bit of a disclaimer, which is I'm purposefully gonna be painting a bit of a caricature of the current landscape in order to one, be a bit provocative and two, to try to foster some discussion. And of course, my, my answer is also gonna be colored by my background. I'm coming from a controls background and I've been working in this learning and control space. Um, so I'd also really love to hear from folks who are coming at this more from a robotics perspective and from a learnings perspective, either you know after the, after the talk. Really what I'm trying to initiate here is a discussion. Okay, so with that being said, why have we seen this limited success in terms of trying to achieve uh, algorithms that are simultaneously uh, achieving high performance and also have rigorous guarantee. So my impression from kind of looking at this L4DC space is that there's probably two, kind, two kinds of people that work in this area. You have people from the learning community that are in essence trying to hack some safety into their favorite learning algorithm. And you have people coming from the controls community who are in essence trying to hack some kind of learning into their favorite control algorithm. And so rather than trying to rethink these methods from the ground up, what you instead end up with is some kind of incremental improvement over existing methods that are already in those fields. So let me, let me give you some examples of what I mean. And again, these are meant to be caricatures, so I'm really not trying to offend anybody or pick on anyone. Um, so here's a typical recipe for a data-driven control paper. Take the, standard, um, take the standard feedback control loop, and then take any one of these blocks uh, and replace it or design it or analyze it using learning. It doesn't matter if there's an actual reason for using learning here or if it improves performance, just use learning and see if you can say something. Um, I also wanna emphasize that I'm 100% guilty of this. Uh, some of the work that I did during my postdoc, for example, on characterizing the sample complexity of learning to control uh, the linear quadratic regulator definitely falls into this category and would be one of those deep theory but limited practical impact papers. Um, now, at the time, there was a reason to do this in this sense was we wanted to establish some theoretical baselines and understanding um, in terms of what you could and couldn't do using data. But now at this point, we're about four or five years in and we have those baselines. So from my perspective, it's time to move on to a different way of thinking. Similarly, if you wanna write a safe learning paper, take your favorite RL algorithm, add some kind of regularizer or penalty that penalizes safety violations, typically only approximately in an expectation, compare it to a vanilla baseline that ignores safety and celebrate, you've done something new. Okay, so what I'm gonna argue is that what's mostly missing, and I say mostly because there are examples of other groups doing really nice work of this flavor, um, is what we really need is a ground up rethinking of learning and control where both are considered from the start and on equal footing. And so with this preamble in mind, what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is some of the progress that we've made toward, towards trying to, do just the, trying to do just that. So rather than taking something existing in control or existing in literature and trying to, in learning, and try to hack in either safety or learning, um, we're gonna to try to take theoretical and algorithmic tools from constrained and robust learning and integrate them with ideas from nonlinear stability theory and do this from the ground up. So here's the plan for today. Um, we're gonna start with a warm up where we'll just look at analysis and see how a ground up rethinking of Lyapunov theory from a learning theoretic perspective allows us to make natural connections to robust learning. Then we'll move on to closing the control loop and look at safe imitation learning. And in particular, try to understand how stability plays an important role here. 
But we'll also see that stability is in fact not always enough. And we'll see that constrained learning combined with stability can get us even bigger wins in terms of end-to-end -end stability, a complexity bound. And then finally, if we end up having enough time, we'll also show um, some ways in which we can actually extend these ideas to uh, give us guarantees in the context of perception-based control. Okay, so let's dive in and start thinking about um, just analysis. How would we kind of rethink analysis of the stability uh, or safety of a nonlinear system um, in this kind of new data-driven era? So first, let's just kind of, let's, let's give ourselves a quick reminder of, uh, of Lyapunov theory and its generalization, uh, which I'm gonna call stability circumstance. And, and the main meta theorem can be roughly stated as follows, which says that if I have a nonlinear autonomous system, x of t plus one equals f of x of t, uh, and I'm given some stability certificate v of x. And then if the stability certificate satisfies some algebraic condition, typically in ter and these will typically be specified in terms of v of x and v of f of x, then I can say something meaningful about the properties of my system's trajectory. So the, the most meaningful example, uh, the, the, the most uh, meaningful example of, um, you know, sorry, the, the most familiar exa example of, of such a stability certificate uh, is a Lyapunov function. Uh, and, and, and this certifies stability. Uh, you can generalize this to, to a barrier function. Uh, which certifies safety. So rather than showing that we converge to the origin, we can show that we converge to a set and then the set remains invariant. And then maybe a little bit less familiar, but very powerful is the notion of, uh, of a contraction metric, which certifies incremental stability. And this roughly says that if I have two, if I have two trajectories, they're gonna converge towards each other. Uh, another way of thinking about this is that systems uh, forget their initial condition. Um, the common theme in all of these though is that we can specify them in terms of inequalities uh, or conditions in terms of V of X and V of, F of, v of F of X. And so it gives us a unified way of thinking about this. Um, typically, if we know the dynamics F of X, the way we go about constructing these things is either just using knowledge of the system. We try to cook these things up in terms of, uh, you know, thinking of them as, in terms as generalized energy functions. Or if say f is a polynomial, we can use something like say sum of squares programming to, to search for, for them in, in a more systematic, systematic fashion. Um, okay. So what I'd like to do now is maybe motivate why um, in this new data-driven era, we may wanna use actually some, some learning techniques to try to, to try to extract out a stability certificate. And these traditional methods might fail. So, um, Let's consider a typical reinforcement learning pipeline, which, which can, uh, as a cartoon, look like this. Uh, so I have my system and I have some objective. They get fed into a, a fancy algorithm with, with uh, a fancy reinforcement learning algorithm. And uh, usually my policy will be parameterized by some complicated function class, such as say a deep neural network. Then I'll turn my RL crank and this will produce a policy, which after I close the loop, gives me a closed loop autonomous system. Now in these kinds of settings, oftentimes the dynamics will not be known because I'll often be querying them through, for example, a simulator. And even if they are, the resulting closed loop system will be very difficult to work with analytically. Um, so for example, uh, also I wanna point out that you can also definitely replace say, a fancy RL algorithm with something like say iterative LQR or MPC with nonlinear MPC or sequential linearization. And the same principle, uh, the same high level idea kind of holds through, which is that the resulting closed loop system is something that's very difficult to work with analytically. So the resulting question then becomes, how can I certify the stability of such system? Um, so let's go back to our meta theorem. And, and I'm gonna specialize our discussion uh, to Lyapunov functions, but hopefully it's gonna be clear that everything I'm gonna talk about here generalizes easily to, uh, to both barrier functions and contraction metrics or any other certificate that you like just by tweaking the inequalities that we're gonna enforce. And in fact, everything's also gonna extend very naturally to continuous time systems. Um, in the paper, we actually do everything in continuous time, but I'm doing things in discrete time to be consistent with the second half of the talk. Um, so what we're gonna set out as our data-driven goal here 
is the following is the following problem. What we're going to want to do is um, using only trajectory data, we're going to try to find a Lyapunov certificate function v from some function class such that the probability of a trajectory not satisfying this decreased condition. So the condition that we want is for it to be less than or equal to zero. So we're looking for the probability of violation. We want to, we want to make sure that that's small. Now, our approach to doing this is going to be uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, but there's going to be one little subtle tweak to the algorithm that, that ends up being very important. So the idea, as I mentioned, is kind of as simple and straightforward as you can think of. We're going to sample n IID initial conditions, C1 through Cn, right? And then we're just going to roll out n IID trajectories from them, x0 to xt, right? So this is the one little bit of notation that I'm asking you to remember, which is I'm going to denote xt of c. I'm going to use this to denote the state of my system at time t starting from the initial con condition x0 is equal to c. So given this collected data, I'm just going to look for a Lyapunov certificate function that satisfies this decrease condition, but I, need it to, I want it to be satisfied robustly. Right? So I want it to satisfy this decrease condition, but with some gamma margin, with, with some, some margin negative gamma. It's going to turn out that robustifying this constraint is going to be very important. Uh, for top, is there a question? No, not at the moment. No, okay, sure. Sorry. Um, okay, so um, okay, so th this is our setup. Um, so this is what we're trying to prove. This is going to be the algorithm that, that we're going to suggest. So now, in order to understand how to analyze this approach, we need to take a small detour into statistical learning theory, and in particular, um, into empirical risk minimization. So empirical risk minimization is really the workhorse of supervised machine learning. And I'm sure that this is familiar to, to some, if not most of you, um, but it's always good to, to review things. So or at least it certainly can't hurt. So I'll try to do that quickly on this slide here. So the basic setup is as follows. Suppose I have some data pairs, X and Y, that are jointly distributed according to some distribution B. Then I can pose a bunch of problems that I care about things like hypothesis testing, classification, regression, filtering, et cetera, as the following risk minimization problem, where I'm looking for the best function f that minimizes the expected loss under the distribution d, that captures the mismatch between my prediction, f of x, and the measurement y. This is kind of a, a standard uh, risk minimization problem. Of course, the challenge is that this optimization problem is posed is impossibly hard. We typically don't know the distribution d. Even if we did, the expectation typically can't be evaluated in closed form. Even if it could, the optimization problem is infinite dimensional. It's over function. So what we approximate it by is uh, an empirical risk minimization problem, where we instead sample n pairs of data, iid from the distribution d. We approximate the expectation with an empirical version of it. And we replace this infinite dimensional minimization problem with one over a class of functions, calligraphic f here, that are easier to optimize for. Okay. So that's the basic setup. What I'm going to attempt to do now is summarize statistical learning theory in half a slide. Um, so it's going to be a little challenging, but I think we can do it. OK, so here's the key equation. What we care about is the true loss. And I'm using this shorthand to denote this expression here. So I'm just suppressing the x and the y. We really just care about the, the loss achieved by, the, by some function f. So we care about the true loss. But what we can measure is this empirical loss. So I'm using e hat of n to denote the empirical approximation to the true expectation. Okay. So this is what I can actually measure and optimize over. Um, and so given that, what we care about then is making sure that this generalization error, which is the difference between the true and the empirical loss, is small. And roughly speaking, what you want to do is you want to push this empirical loss down as much as possible while guaranteeing that this generalization error is suitably small. And that's what statistical learning theory is all about. And there was lots of ways to argue that this actually happened. 
There are methods based on algorithmic stability, which, which essentially argue that, um, which essentially argue that um, uh, if you change one data point in your training data, the resulting F that gets spit out doesn't change too much. There are, methods, there are arguments based on margin bounds, which say that if your data is easily separable, good things happen. And there are, there are, there are methods based off of uni, uniform convergence, which argue that for all F in your function class F, this generalization error is small. And those are the kinds of guarantees that I'm gonna discuss today based on uniform convergence. Um, so the, 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 the question is the expectation over all data sets. Now the expectation here is just over a pair X, Y distributed according to D. Um, later on, we'll talk about, later on we'll talk about probability, probabilities over sample data. And I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to, to be explicit uh, about that. Um, okay. So in the context of these uniform convergence guarantees, where we're trying to guarantee that this expression, this generalization error is small for any F from the function class F that I care about, there are broadly two, roughly two main results. The first, which is, which is kind of more widely known, is that when the empirical loss is big, quote unquote, or not small, um, then your generalization error, this term here, roughly scales like some measure of the complexity of my function class divided by square root n. Okay, so the way you can think about this is this is essentially my bias. So if I have a very rich function class, I can push this down very small, but this is then my variance and this can get big. So this is a generalization of a bias variance trade-off. Second, and there's another result which is maybe uh, less well-known but really important is that when you can actually make your empirical loss close to zero, you get what are called fast rates which is that rather than getting a one over square root n scaling in terms of your data points, you get a one over n, right? Now, this may just seem like kind of a subtle difference and something that only theoreticians care about, but um, when your data points are actually trajectories, this can make a big difference. A, square, a, a half factor can be the difference between having to collect 10,000 or a billion trajectories. Um, so I'll, I'll discuss that. I'll, I'll kind of emphasize this later when it comes in, when it actually makes a difference. And then the last thing that I want to mention is that the key ingredients that are needed to make these kinds of ideas go through are one, you need a bounded and Lipschitz loss function. And this needs to hold for all possible data that your, Lipschitz, that your loss function can see. And similarly, you need your function class F to be simple in a suitable sense. And that's what's captured by this complexity term. For, again, for all possible data that your function class, that your functions can see. Now you can imagine that when your data is being generated by a dynamical system, stability might end up playing a huge role here. And again, I'm going to try to highlight this and emphasize this interplay between statistical learning theory and stability as we go as we go through through the rest of the talk. Okay, so with with that um, half slide of, of, uh, of background, you're all, all experts in statistical learning theory. So let's go back to our um, problem of learning stability certificates from data. So again, just to remind everyone, this is our approach to trying to learn a, to learn a, a certificate from data. I'm sampling, uh, I'm sampling n IID uh, initial conditions to roll out n trajectories. And then I'm looking for a certificate that satisfies this decrease condition with some margin negative gamma. So it's a robust uh, learning problem or a robust feasible, robustly feasible certificate. So what I'm gonna show now is that a couple of simple observations, let us analyze this problem essentially as a one class classification empirical risk minimization problem. So let me kind of unpack that statement for you. So first I'm gonna define the following empirical loss function. And so what this is doing is it's essentially counting the number of trajectories for which a certificate V violates this robust uh, condition, right? So if I, have, if I have say two trajectories for which my certificate V does not satisfy this, then this will give me two over N. That's what, it'll, that's what the score will come out. So I'm just counting the number of times that my function V does not classify a trajectory as being less than or equal to negative gamma. So that's what I mean by this is a one class classification problem. I wanna classify all trajectories as less than or equal to negative gamma. Okay, but now take a look at this. 
again, I'm going to unpack what this is. This first term here is the probability of certificate failure. This was the original probability that we set out to bound. Now I can upper bound this by the probability of my certificate failing um, this more, this, this stricter robust, this, uh, this stricter robust uh, condition, right? Because this is just a stricter condition. So it's more likely to, be, to fail it. But notice that this is exactly the expectation of the indicator function of the thing inside of it. And this is exactly the true expected loss that corresponds to the empirical loss that are defined up here. And not only that, any feasible V hat to this problem up here is by construction achieving a zero empirical risk. So it's just a little bit of kind of sleight of hand to show that we've, even though we didn't pose this as an empirical risk minimization problem, we still come out with an empirical risk minimizer to this problem. And what this allows us to do then is apply a theorem from Cerebro et al, suitably specialized to get the following bound, which says that if my system is in fact stable, then with probability at least one minus delta, and this probability is over the training data. So this comes back to the question that was asked earlier. I have that the probability that I see a new trajectory that violates my, um, my decreased condition Scales, scales basically as a function of these two terms here. And I'm only suppressing con like universal constants um, and, and universal constants. So this first term is gonna be the dominant one and I'm gonna unpack it on the next slide. And the second term basically scales like log one over delta over n. So we got a fast rate. This BH here is a uniform bound on H, which we know exists because F is assumed to be stable. And this is really just stable in the sense of Lyapunov. I just need X to be bounded for, 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 for all time. Um, okay. So this is the first point of the slide, which is just a little bit of effort and a little bit of suitable interpretation of things from a statistical learning perspective. I get this really nice interpretation. Um, so the first term that the first term now is what we're going to want to unpack. Up top, this is what's called a Rademacher complexity square. This is that complexity of the function class. And underneath, we have the margin term. So let's unpack this a little bit. So first of all, let's look at the role of the margin gamma. So in my half slide tutorial on statistical learning theory, I mentioned that we needed a bounded and Lipschitz loss function. But the loss function that I introduced was a step function. It's this indicator thing. This is as non-smooth and as non-Lipschitz as they get. So what the margin lets me do is introduce a smooth surrogate function that's an upper bound to it. And I can instead do my analysis on that surrogate. And the larger the margin, the smoother the surrogate function I can introduce. And so in turn, what this says is that if I can find a feasible certificate for a larger margin, so the more robust my certificate is, the smoother I can make the surrogate function and the better my generalization bounds are as a function of gamma, and that's reflected here. So I have this one over gamma squared scaling. The bigger gamma is, the better my scale. Next up is my model complexity term. So this is called the Rademacher complexity, and, and this is the definition. And I appreciate that it's a bit scary looking, um, but the way to interpret this, and these, these epsilon i's here are basically, uh, each one are i, i, b, and they're with probability one half plus or minus one. The way to interpret this is it's a measure of the ability of the function class H composed with V to fit a random binary signal. So again, if the system is stable and the function class V isn't too complex, then each of these terms here are limited in how much they can vary. And this limits how much damage each of these things can do. Um, and so that's kind of the intuition in terms of why stability is important here. Um, so some examples of what we can work out, just to kind of give you an idea of what the scaling ends up looking like. Um, if I set my function class to be, for example, uh, a smooth parametric function with k degrees of freedom and bounded weights. So this would be, for example, a fully connected neural network with k weights, where I have a bound on the, on the norm of the weights. Then we can show that the complexity scales like the, free, the complexity squared scales like the number of free parameters divided by the number of data points. Um, this per, the, 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 um, 
The second line down here corresponds to sum of square certificates. And if I were to naively apply the same analysis method as above here, I would get V squared over N. But by further exploiting the structure of this, of this function class, we get a better scaling. And so this also shows that by taking structure into account, you can get a better bounds out of it. So just, these are just two examples of function classes for which we can get nice uh, upper bounds and that they reflect essentially the idea that the number of free parameters in my, um, the effective number of free parameters in my, uh, in my function class are captured by this model complexity term. So if we just kind of plug things back in and just focus on the first term, what we see is that um, roughly the failure probability of our certificate scales like the degrees of freedom of my certificate function divided by the margin squared divided by n, which is the number of trajectories I've collected. And again, I wanna emphasize the importance of fast rates here as well in the context of safety critical systems. If I wanted five nines of reliability, this is the difference between needing to collect 10,000 trajectories and 10 billion trajectories. So this matters. Okay. So a quick, uh, just a quick little example of what this looks like in practice um, before moving on to the second half of the talk. Um, so I have some implementation details at the bottom here. I'm not gonna go over them in detail, uh, but happy to discuss them after the talk. So let's start with a toy example uh, of a damped pendulum. So the dynamics are written here just for reference, but we don't use them at any time. We use a thousand trajectories to learn the Lyapunov enough function. The initial conditions are sampled uniformly at random as described here. So the first uh, figure uh, shown is shown here uh, just to kind of illustrate that the learn Lyapunov function actually does satisfy the, de the, de the decreased condition and the sense that the learned level sets are invariant. So what we did here was we densely sampled initial conditions along the, the, the 10 level set and we rolled them out. You see that they all converge to the, to, the, to the origin. The second figure here also shows that the learn Lyapunov function is informative enough to actually be used for adaptive control. Um, so specifically what we do here is we perturb the system with a, an unknown random sum of 10 sinusoids. And we scale these sinusoids by either 1x, 6x, or 10x. And then we use an adaptive controller that's kind of standard from, from JJ Slatine's book to regulate the system back to the origin. Um, so we see that even if we crank the magnitude of the sinusoids up by a factor of 10, the adaptive controller does just fine. That's the main figure. Uh, you know, notice the x-axis is only between negative one and one. Whereas without adaptation, which is what's in the inset here, uh, things just go off the rails, right? Again, notice the y axis. Okay, uh, maybe a little bit more realistic or interesting example is we looked at stable standing for quadrupeds. So we used a pie bullet simulation of a minotaur quadruped. Uh, and um, what we wanted to see was how it recovered from random kicks. Uh, and the controller was stable, the system was stabilized with just a hand tuned PD controller. So, unfortunately, I don't have any videos of this, but what I have shown on the right here is um, uh, the learning curve in terms of the probability, the error probability as a function of the number of samples uh, and the number of trajectories collected. And this is validated on a 10,000 trajectory test set. Um, so, let's just focus on the green curve. And so, what we're plotting here are uh, 10. 50th and 90th percentiles over 30 different experiments. Uh, and you can see that after about 50,000 trajectories, we, we achieve on the order of 99% uh, accuracy or about a 1% error. So this works nicely. Okay. Um, is, is Delta, so a question is, is Delta a design parameter? What was Delta here? I think uh, Delta here was actually, uh, I forget, I think it was 0 0.01. So what we're, we're looking for 1% failure. That's a good question. Um, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, Delta is absolutely, is absolutely a design parameter. Um, that being said, uh, is this learning certificate a kind of offline training? Um, it could be used as a way to, um, after you've trained, so, I'll discuss using learned certificates as regularizers actually in the next part of the talk. In this context, right now, we're just doing analysis. So I'm given a system and I just want to understand if it's stable or not. So we're not actually doing any training in terms of modifying the policy. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll mention how these, these these certificates can actually be used as a regularizer in training in, in the in the next part of the talk. Um, so this is actually a, a natural breakpoint for for questions. So it's, it's great that they're they're coming through in the chat. Uh, actually, I had a question. Uh, yeah, absolutely. About k, uh, so I understand that's the uh, the number of free parameters. Now I would. Mm -hmm. have so it makes sense that if you have more free parameters, you are going to have a larger bound, uh, a higher bound. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, it also feels like if you have more free parameters, then you have you are allowing a larger complexity in the model, so you should be able to do better. So end yes. up with a lower bound. So it seems like it the interpretation can go both ways. And I'm just curious your thought to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, here, let me kind of go back. Uh, Um, so if we go back here, the larger K will let you push down the empirical risk, right? So you, that, that gives you better performance in that sense. That allows you to get zero empirical risk, but at the expense of having more variance, right? So it's kind of bias variance trade-off. What, what's a little different here is that by construction, we're, co we're setting ourselves up to have zero empirical risk. Um, and so if we're feasible, then the only thing we have to worry about is this complexity. Um, so it's not quite as, it, it doesn't have this quite st as straightforward bias variance trade-off interpretation. Um, but kind of the, the way to think about this is you wanna pick just enough free parameters to get a feasible problem, but no more. Um, it makes sense, yeah. thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Great question, okay. Uh, and, and I saw earlier that there was a question asking to see the road, the, the roadmap again. Um, so I apologize that I didn't go backwards earlier, but it's here again. So um, here we go. Uh, so we've got, um, so that's, we finished up our warm up, which was learning stability certificates from data. Um, are the free parameters your effective VC dimension? Yeah, okay. So uh, last question and I'm gonna move on, but these are all great questions. I'm happy to discuss them more. So I'm using Rademacher complexity. Uh, so you can show that if your system has bounded VC dimension, you have bounded Rademacher complexity. That, that's, that's, there's an inequality that can be used to show that. There are systems that have, sorry, there are function classes with bounded Rademacher complexity that do not have bounded VC dimension. So, but they're all effectively just different measures of function class complexity. Uh, Peter Bartlett and uh, forgetting the other author have a really nice paper that kind of lay out the connection between Rademacher complexity, Gaussian complexity, VC dimension. Um, the Shy and Shy textbook as well is really great um, uh, on understanding machine learning and th theory and algorithms. That has a really nice discussion of all this as well. Um, this is a great question. Okay. All right, so I'm going to keep going here, but yeah, these are awesome questions. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to talk now about closing the loop. Um, and before kind of diving into the, the, the technical meat, I want to highlight um, an additional kind of subtlety that we have to deal with. Um, and I, I want to start off with the, the classical system and identification and control pipeline, right? So to, to kind of highlight where this issue comes into play and why it comes about. So I'm given my system, in this case, let's say it's a bipedal robot. And the first thing that I would do classically would be to write down a model of its dynamics using say first principles. In this case, it would be rigid body equations in motion. Um, then I'd collect some data, solve some regression problem. Um, then I'd collect some data to learn the parameters, sorry, that characterize these equations of motions by solving some regression problem. Uh, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll denote these estimates with uh, the, these matrices with the hats on them. Uh, next up, uh, especially if, if I'm concerned with robustness or safety, uh, what I might want to do is an uncertainty quantification step associated with these estimates. Um, and then I'd use these uncertainty bounds to solve either a robust or optimal control problem to control the loop with a policy that guarantees not only performance, but also safety, safe control, um, but also robust stability and safety, sorry. The last thing that I want to say on this slide uh, is to make something explicit about this paradigm um, which is that the notion of uncertainty that is emphasized in this classical pipeline is that of model parameter error. There is an underlying notion of a true M 
C and G. Um, the the um, inertial Coriolis and gravitational terms, and we're we're bounding in absolute terms the gaps between the identified estimates and the true parameter. Okay. So I want to emphasize that, keep that in mind as we now look at uh, the modern incarnation of this of, of this this pipeline. So again, we start with our same system, and now the first difference would be in the modeling step, perhaps for example, where now. Some or all of the dynamics are modeled by a rich functional class, such as say a deep neural network. Now again, I proceed as before to collect some data and, and fit my model through some regression step. The next big difference is gonna be in the uncertainty quantification step. In particular, because there is now no longer any notion of a true model parameter with respect to bound errors. I mean, I know that my underlying robot isn't, the dynamics are not actually a deep neural network. I have to resort to bounding prediction error over trajectories. So for example, I can do this in a probabilistic manner. Um, then once again, we can then use this uncertainty in say a in a prediction error to formulate a possibly robust policy optimization problem, where now the policy and maybe even the uncertainty are also parametrized as deep neural networks with the hope of generating a safe controller. And this, is show this has been shown to, in some cases, especially when we get to collect a lot of data, work quite well. Um, what I wanna highlight though, in, is that in this new paradigm, and I'm observing this is you know, really becoming increasingly prevalent, especially in the learning for control space that I work in, is that we've really shifted uh, in terms of putting an emphasis on prediction error rather than model parameter error. And this brings with it an additional subtlety. And this is that these prediction errors only hold under the trajectory generating distribution that I used during training. And in particular, once I close the control loop, the distribution changes. So these guarantees go out the window. Uh, and so it's really hard to actually say anything meaningful about the closed loop, uh, the, the closed loop behavior of this system. So from my perspective, this points to a need to rethink the control pipeline to account for distribution dependent uncertainty. Now, I really wanna emphasize that nothing I'm seeing here is new or earth shattering. Um, it, it's something that's been really deeply appreciated and understood by the reinforcement learning and imitation learning communities for a long time, but I'm kind of pausing to make this point for two reasons. One is I don't think that it's actually as well appreciated or understood, at least within my contemporaries in the controls community. And I think that there is an opportunity for tools and insights of robust control uh, to be brought to bear on problems in safe learning and control if this challenge can actually be overcome. All right, so with my, my, with my preamble in mind, uh, what I'd like you to view is kind of the, the second half of this talk as a first step towards this broader goal uh, where we're using safe imitation learning as a case study. Right, so it's kind of this idea of needing to rethink uh, the control pipeline uh, to account for distribution dependence. Learning. Sorry, I got caught up in my rant, but I forgot to click the slides. Um, okay, um, so first of all, let's just kind of remind ourselves what, what imitation learning looks like. Um, right, so we're gonna focus on imitation learning. A vanilla version of imitation learning goes something like this. I'm gonna run my expert to collect some expert state and input data. Then I'll solve a regression problem or a supervised learning problem to try to map, to try to imitate this, the, the expert policy and spit out a, a pie hat. Uh, and then I'm gonna deploy it and essentially hope for the best um, on, on the real system. This will generate a new trajectory XT and pie hat of XT. More sophisticated versions might close the loop and have the expert then relabel this data and kind of iterate on it. Um, so what I wanna emphasize is that the kind of risk associated with distribution shifts here is that while I can apply empirical risk minimization kind of out of the box to get guarantees on um, the error between my learned pi hat and the expert under the trajectories generated by the expert, what I really care about are, is, this is this imitation error under trajectories generated by my learned policy. And it's not clear that this actually transfers over as is. And this is again, widely recognized as kind of the issue is covariate shift um, in imitation learning. And kind of to give you a, a cartoon illustration of what this looks like, suppose I've collected my, my expert trajectories and I'm using this shaded region here as a cartoon representation of what the expert distribution is. So suppose I learn a policy, it's gonna have some error in it, so it won't exactly mimic the, the expert. 
So now suppose I start at this black dot. Now the blue arrow is what the expert would do. The red arrow is what my learn policy does. Uh, because there's a small error, I end up over here. Kind of rinse and repeat. This is what the expert would do. This is what I do because there's a small error. Well, uh-oh, now all of a sudden I've kind of fallen outside of my training distribution. So while the expert knows what to do, I make an even bigger error because this is outside of what I saw during training. Expert kind of knows what to do. I make a huge error now and everything kind of blows up on me. This is kind of what, this is what happens if you, this is the risk of applying vanilla behavior cloning or vanilla imitation learning. Um, so what we want to understand in, in this context are really control theoretic questions, but from a learning theoretic perspective, uh, which is how much data do I need to transfer over stability and safety guarantees of an expert to a learned policy? And can the um, underlying stability, safety, and smoothness properties of an expert affect the sample complexity needed to avoid these kind of catastrophic failures? All right, so let me um, introduce the, the problem formulation and the setup for this part of the talk. I'm gonna assume that I'm given known dynamics and they're gonna be control affine. So we're not even worrying about having to learn the dynamics or anything here. We're gonna assume that we know the dynamics and we're just focusing on uh, imitation learning. I have some safety constraints. So you can think of these as being enforced in terms of, um, of being enforced in terms of maybe cert safety certificates, stability certificates, polytopic constraints, anything you'd like. And then I'm assuming that I'm given an expert policy uh, that satisfies two properties. One is that it's safe and it's safe again with some margin gamma. So this gives me some wiggle room while I'm learning. And the other is that it's stable and it's stable in a very precise sense. And I'll, I'll explain this in a second. Um, now, before I get to explaining this notion of stability, I want to give you some intuitive idea of what kind of experts are actually consistent with our Oracle model and which ones aren't. So what would be consistent would be essentially optimization-based policies that have some guarantees of stability with them. So think model predictive control, control the Yapanov function or control barrier function-based controllers, even something like iterative LQR or sequential MPC, nonlinear MPC, or some other computationally expensive policy that you've somehow convinced yourself of is also stable or safe. Not consistent with our Oracle model uh, would be humans. Uh, and the reason for this is that our approach just need, is on policy. Uh, and so we need to be able to actually call the expert as a functional call. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with Dagger, we basically have a similar setup to Dagger. Um, okay. So with that in mind, let's consider this, let's unpack this, this stability alphabet soup definition here. Um, so we're going to assume that our expert policy leads to this beta rho gamma exponential incremental input state stability, which I realize is a mouthful. Um, so let's unpack this. So beta rho are two positive constants and rho is a contraction rate between zero and one. And so we say that this expert leads to this notion of stability. If I have two versions of the system that I run in parallel, one is just running as it is and the other version is being perturbed by some disturbance signal UP. And if I can show that for all possible initial conditions, X zero and Y zero and perturbation signals, this inequality holds. The first term in this inequality is basically just showing that, is basically saying that, no, that if there's no disturbances, then my system forgets uh, differences in initial conditions exponentially quickly. So this is this notion of contraction metrics, um, but we're actually quantifying the rate at which this happens. The second term in the inequality says that bounded disturbances have bounded effects. Right? And again, we can quantify this in a meaningful way. And then you wanna understand the effect of both non different initial conditions and, and disturbances. You just need to add these two pictures together, but that's just a little bit beyond my PowerPoint skills. So you'll have to use your imagination. Okay. Um, so with that in mind, let's now introduce uh, the imitation loss that we're gonna consider and the problem setup. So a little bit of notation, again, I apologize. We saw this earlier. Um, we saw earlier that X of T of C is the state of time T starting at initial condition C. Now I'm gonna add the superscript here to denote the data generating distribution. So this says that this is also the state that's evolving underneath the policy pi B. This is just something that we need to keep track of. Um, 
And I'm going to introduce the loss function that we care about. So this loss function is essentially the running sum of the difference between how policies pi one and pi two enter the dynamics evolving under the data generating distribution pi p. So it's a fairly natural loss function to consider. It's the difference between two policies and how they enter the system evaluated on data generated by some other policy type. And we're gonna to need to be able to keep track of all of these things. Unfortunately, it's just a lot of bookkeeping. So our problem statement then becomes, I wanna learn some policy pi hat using n trajectories of length p such that with high probability, again, over the training data, my imitation loss is small and I'm safe. And importantly, all of these guarantees need to hold under the distribution induced by my learned policy. I care about test time guarantees, not training time guarantees. Okay, so the first thing we wanna see is, let's see if just stability is enough to get us over this distribution shift hump. So let's take vanilla, vanilla behavior cloning and add a stability constraint. So I'm gonna draw n initial conditions, roll out my expert policy, and then solve the following constrained empirical risk minimization problem. So the loss function is what I would be basically solving in vanilla uh, imitation learning. And I'm just gonna add this additional constraint, which says that I want my learned policy to be stable in this precise sense that I defined earlier. Now there's a key identity here that allows us to carry over the guarantees from data generated under pi star to data generated by pi hat. And it's the following one here. Exploiting the, the, the control affine structure of the system, we can rewrite the closed loop under pi star as the closed loop under pi hat. And essentially what we can say is that um, because of the stability of the learned policy, and the fact that this imitation loss is essentially minimizing the perturbation. If I have small imitation loss, then I can carry over these guarantees as long as my, ex, as long as my learned policy and my expert are, are, are both stable. Um, so I wanna make a couple of small notes in terms of enforcing stability in practice. This is actually something that's kind of hard to do. Uh, it's a global notion. It needs to be enforced uniformly across the states. So if things are polynomial, I can use sum of squares. Um, it's not too hard to work in the stability certificates results here that I showed previously. Uh, and you can show that you can deal with the, 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 the stability, the, the distribution shift as well. What we've seen in practice though, is that it, it often suffices to enforce this only on trajectories um, using either a heuristic or learned certificate or even not at all. Uh, and the reason for this is that because, mo is because most empirical risk minimizers, most policies that give you a good loss are just stable to begin with. Um, and so what really, just, what really matters is just the underlying stability properties of the expert. Unfortunately, we just don't have the theory to capture this yet. So let's see what kind of guarantees we can prove here. Uh, I'm gonna introduce some, some assumptions here. I'm only gonna focus on um, the ones that, mat that matter, um, which is that we're, I'm, I'm restricting the policy class pi here to just be, um, fully connected multi-layer perceptrons or neural networks with uh, K weights, but everything extends uh, to more general settings. Uh, I'm just doing this to streamline the, par the parametrization. Okay, so what we can show is that with high probability over the training data, we have that our algorithm is feasible and we can show that the learned policy has low imitation loss. Um, and I wanna kind of unpack this, right? So it scales, roughly as one over the stability squared times this complexity term. Um, and kind of more formally, this one over stability term here captures the gain of my system, the gain of the stability of my X, of my closed loop system. Or another way to think about it is the Lipschitz constant of my loss function. And the complexity term captures the interaction between my loss function and the complexity of my policy class, which roughly scales like, uh, free parameters over stability squared. So that's how we go from this line here to this side here. We can also extend this to show safety, basically just by applying Markov's inequality. And what I wanna highlight is that, you know, safety ends up being harder, but still polynomial. We're comparing uh, upper bounds. So this is kind of a little bit uh, unfair. That being said, um, this also actually manifested itself in practice. So I don't feel too bad about doing it. 
Okay, so we end up with, you know, let's just focusing on imitation loss. We see that we end up with a cubic dependence on the game. Uh, so if my system is not super stable, this might not actually work well with reasonable amounts of data. And we actually see that this manifests itself in practice. So for easy tasks, stability is absolutely enough. Um, so we've been working with some folks at Google to test this stuff out on a quadrupedal, um, on quadrupedal robots. So for this task here, we have an MPC expert that's walking forward. And the goal is to basically uh, cover two squares. So after two squares, it will get reset to the origin, which is this vertical blue line. And so you see that the expert is doing fine and it survives uh, for about two squares. And the behavior cloning example, uh, it's a little bit wobblier, but it also does pretty good. Uh, I'm hoping that these videos aren't too jittery uh, over, the, over the streaming. Um, okay, so this does fine. But let's take a look at a harder, let's take a look at a harder, um, at a harder task which is to walk in a circle. Again, I'll let the expert go. And the, the, the thing to kind of pay attention to here is survival time, how long this thing goes before getting reset. And let's compare it to the behavior cloning. The behavior cloning really just fails miserably. Occasionally it'll make it, but it never goes anywhere nearly as long as the expert. So what we see is that for harder tasks, stability isn't just enough. Um, but the, the issue here is that if we think about it, we didn't do a whole lot to actually manage the distribution shift from training to test time. We just made one big jump and hoped that stability would be enough to compensate, would be enough to compensate for it. So what I'm going to show you now is that if we actually take a more careful approach, we can actually do better. And again, for those of you who are, who know what Dagger is, uh, you can think of what I'm going to present next as Dagger, but with guarantees for continuous control. Okay, so what we have here is an episodic algorithm where we start with a data generating policy equal to pi star. And we're gonna split this up into episodes. All right, so E is the number of episodes. And then it's, it's more or less proceeds as before. So I'm gonna draw N over E uh, initial conditions for each episode. So I'm splitting my data up. I roll things out under the current data generating policy. And now I'm solving the following empirical risk minimization problem. Again, I have my imitation loss. What's new is this distribution shift constraint, which is essentially a trust region constraint, which says that I can't wander too far away from the current data generating distribution. I basically have to stay within the statistical noise. And then I update my next policy according to this mixing parameter alpha. And I wanna make sure that my next policy, my next data generating policy is stable. Just as previously, the key identity that we have uh, is based off of this kind of idea that the next policy is stable. And now instead of the imitation loss, it's the distribution shift constraint that allows us to control the distribution shift. And we have this extra degree of freedom, which is alpha, which allows us to tune things according to the underlying stability. So if my system is more stable, I can take more aggressive steps. And if it's less stable, I can take shorter steps and do more epoch. Okay. And then, you know, we just update the next data generating policy. And then this last technical step is just, we need to, in the last epoch, we subtract off the expert and renormalize appropriate. Okay, so what are the corresponding guarantees for this, this what we call constrained mixing iterative learning or CMIL? Um, essentially the same guarantees as before. Um, so what are the guarantees that we can show? Then with probability at least one minus delta over the training, uh, over the training data, I have that the final policy does not depend on the expert and has low imitation loss and is safe. But the important takeaway here is that if I take a small number of shifts where small means logarithmic in essentially this, the gain of my system, this one over stability uh, factor, then I shave off a factor on the powers that show up here in terms of this one over stability. So previously this was cubed and that was to the fourth. Again, this may seem like something that only a theorist would care about, but this actually ended up having a huge difference in practice. So again, kind of going back to this quadrupedal locomotion example, um, a little bit more details in terms of what we did here. It's a unit, it's an A1 unitary uh, pie bullet simulator. The dynamics are from MIT and Minichita. It's an 18 degree of freedom system. Our expert policy is a model fitted to controller. Turns out this is very, uh, very slow to compute and our learned policies gave ended up giving a 10x speed up in execution. 
And the task is to walk in a circle subject to random impulses. What I didn't tell you earlier is that we trained this using only 12 trajectories of a thousand time steps. So again, just to kind of remind you, my MPC expert uh, is walking in circles and lasts a fairly long time. My behavior cloning, which is basically just relying on the stability of the expert, does okay, but it really kind of just falls over pretty quickly. Now, if we compare that to our algorithm that takes the that takes careful shifts, you see it's not perfect, but it does pretty well. Again, the thing to pay attention to here is survival time. Right, so you can see that we can do a lot better by actually carefully managing the distribution shift. Right, and I, I recognize that I'm really running out of time. So um, I'm not gonna explain these slides, but I'm gonna just show that those were not one-off examples that we can actually quantifiably show that we beat these things and we also reduce variance. Um, and that those weren't just one-off examples. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna have time to explain how we can actually extend these things to perception-based control. I'll just say that under suitable assumptions, we can basically push everything through and still get guarantees and train a perception-based controller using a state feedback-based expert. Um, okay, so I'll just wrap up with what, and end with what I hope I convinced you of. So I hope I convinced you that learning and control need to be considered uh, on equal footing. And then specifically that robust stability under distribution dependent uncertainty can be enforced through constrained empirical risk minimization. But stability matters, and it's not just for control, but also for learning. And this can be quantified explicitly through um, sample complexity rates. That um, safety is harder than performance. Uh, we saw this quickly, but control, but learning theoretic approaches offer paths to polynomial sample complexity. And function class and future choice matters. Now, we didn't get to see this in the context of perception-based control, but we saw at least some examples that exploiting structure as much as possible when characterizing function class complexity can get you a win. And I'll just end by saying that, you know, while I started off by saying that, you know, things are kind of broken, um, I really view this that uh, um, as an opportunity uh, and a to rethink things from the ground up with learning and control and equal footing. Uh, and I, I really also want to say that this doesn't mean that we have to give up on modularity. I think this is a really important component uh, in terms of understanding safety in these kinds of systems. But I do think that in this new data-driven world, uh, these components need to be linked together through constrained learning and robust stability. Uh, and this is what's actually gonna give us a way to harness learning in, in a way that allows for not only a high performing systems, but also safe ones. All right, so um, I'm a little bit over time. So I'll say again, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, here are links to the two main papers that I discussed today. I'll thank uh, my, my my funding and my fund my funding agencies and uh, my collaborators as well. Thanks, thanks a lot, Nicola. I'm going to applaud on behalf of the rest of the audience. Uh, uh, folks in the audience, uh, if you have questions, you can type it out uh, or you can raise your hand. Uh, I can look at that, and uh, I can unmute you uh, to uh, so that you can ask questions directly. Uh, I can kick this off. Uh, I had a question about, uh, uh, so, so you, you spoke about uh, uh, distribution shift uh, in the context of uh, imitation learning. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm curious about uh, distribution shift in, in, a, in a more general context going beyond uh, uh, imitation learning. Uh, sort of Going going back to sort of the issue of uh, I think what Nikhil was talking about, which is sort of the, the, the expectations are taken over D, which is uh, in some sense the training data set over here. Uh, so, sort, of, I'm sort of just curious about your thoughts about uh, the issues related to distribution shift beyond uh, imitation yeah. learning types. So of I, I, I had a slide for that um, here. Let me. I, I ended up cutting it. Let me show it. It's always good to have a slide uh, that uh, directly addresses the question, I guess. Yeah. So here, here are four examples where, where distribution shift come up uh, in, in meaningful ways that I think that, that could be interesting. So uh, in safe model-based reinforcement learning, for example, you end up with, with, with distribution shifts popping up across epochs where uh, 
For example, if I'm using learn models and prediction error bounds to design a new policy, uh, as soon as I use those to design a new policy and I play that policy, there's going to be a shift in terms of the types of uh, trajectories that I'm, that, that I'm generating. So there's going to be an issue there. Um, in the context of safe exploration and learning, um, which in some sense can be viewed as a subroutine of safe model-based reinforcement learning, I need to start visiting trajectories that I haven't seen during training. Um, and so that's just by definition, I'm going to see out of distribution trajectories and I need to be able to deal with that. Uh, the problem that actually got me originally thinking about all of this was safe perception-based control. Um, and so you can imagine there, for example, if I use a state feedback-based controller to collect my data, uh, and then at test time, I'm using a perception-based controller, then errors introduced in the feedback loop will also lead to um, distribution shifts. Uh, and then so, you know, what we talked about today, which was safe imitation learning. Um, so these are just four examples. This is by no means um, uh, an exhaustive list. Um, but these were four examples that I could cook up with relatively easy and fit on one slide um, that I think kind of captured the, this idea. And so uh, I think that answers the question. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. That's okay, exactly, awesome. exactly what I had in mind. Uh, thanks. Uh, John Barris has a question. Uh, John, go ahead. Hi, Nikolai. Nice Hi, John. To... Sorry, I came late. I have quite a few questions, but I'll ask one or two. Okay, so the first one is, sure. you know that when I'm talking about learning and safe, learning mm -hmm. is an important trade-off, which means I only learn if I come close to failure. And I have to try to kind of somehow do that, otherwise I'm not learning. In other words, if everything goes cozy, you don't learn how to react when something is really challenging and therefore you're gonna lose safety. And that is a problem that has not been studied a lot, but does it appear anywhere in your studies, this trade-off between being very conservative versus pushing the learning so to actually really learn. Uh, so absolutely. So the, uh, not, that was not addressed in today's talk in any way, shape, or form. Um, so I, I think you may have, I think you were at the, the NSF CPS uh, PI meeting. Yes. And I kind of mentioned this idea of being able to think about in a rigorous way, failing gracefully. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that comes into play here, right? Which is, um, I completely agree that if we're gonna start pushing the boundaries in terms of exploration of what is and isn't safe, then we're gonna inevitably end up wandering into regimes where our models break, um, and especially our learned models. And the notion of being able to fail gracefully and formalizing that notion, I think is potentially a way to, to start reasoning about that. Uh, and I haven't seen that anywhere. Um, so that's something that I'm interested in exploring. I, it, again, it's certainly not the only way to, to think about that problem, but that would be one way that I, that I would, that I would yeah. like to start thinking about it. Okay, thank you. Can I ask another one? Please. Yep, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I noticed that the dynamics problems you have, uh, they don't include uh, what we now call in the field, okay, temporal logic constraints, and in particular, finite time uh, temporal logic constraints, which are important because quite often, failure may mean I don't do things on time, or I say I, I have a UAV or a robot, or in the case of the working that you saw, and I want to complete the circle, right, within five seconds, plus or minus a second, and things like that, okay? Mm -hmm. So is it possible to extend the results to this sort of hybrid system models, you think? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um... One next step that we're looking to do is to extend these, you know, for example, a natural question for imitation learning would be, um, can we do something a little bit more principled and say, learn a policy and say a control barrier function at the same time um, that the simultaneously certifies that policy. There are some challenges in the theory, but I don't think it's, it's, it's unsurmountable. Um, and what's nice about that is um, there's been some recent work, uh, one of the postdocs here at Penn, Lars Lindemann, who's worked with, with Demos. Um, oh, uh, I know, I know, I, know. I work yeah. with Lars, yeah. Yeah, you see, you work with Lars, right? So Lars has shown that if you use time varying CBFs, you can capture yeah, yeah. STL specifications and stuff like that. So that's, again, one possible path forward in that, in, in, towards that direction. Um, I, you know, we're just starting to scratch the surface here. Um, I, I don't see any inherent roadblocks to, to going there, but I mean, we, we haven't gotten there yet. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you.
Awesome. Uh, last call for questions. If not, uh, let's thank our speaker again. Uh, thanks a lot, Nikolai, for an excellent talk. Uh, thank you. And uh, for those of you who uh, asked me, uh, this will be up on the U MRC YouTube channel in a week or so, so you can go back and watch uh, the talk. So thanks a lot, folks. Uh, have a good weekend, and we'll be back with the seminar series next semester. All right. Thanks, everyone.